Well, welcome to Christ Church. So glad that this is a part of your weekend. Church family, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here uh, this weekend. It is a sweet time for us to gather, and uh, I trust that you've already been encouraged uh, by our meeting together. Guests, thank you for coming as well. My name is Adam. I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, I'll add my welcome to Christians a moment ago. Uh, we're really thankful you're here. We've been praying for you and glad that you've come. If you're joining in with us online as a guest, welcome to you as well. Hope kicking the tires online will lead you to joining with us in person. There really is nothing like gathering with God's people here, and I would love for you to do that if at all possible. And if you're part of our family and you're online today, we miss you. And uh, whether it is hardship that keeps you away or a trip or travel, thank you for joining in this way. I hope that God's spirit will be encouraging you. We're looking forward to you being back with us at the first possible opportunity. Just know that we miss you here among us. Well, it is a sweet, sweet time. November is always a great time for us to focus our heart on a, on a very unique need, which is the care of children and I am so overwhelmed. I knew this would happen. I found out this week. I thought this might happen last week. I'm not up to speed on everything prior to it all happening. So as I heard Chrissy uh, last weekend lay out what we were pursuing in raising money, I found out this week that somebody was just like, I'll buy the bus. So the bus has been bought, and uh, I love you for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I knew that would happen. That's the kind of church family this is, and uh, I love it. Let's continue in our generosity. Let's be spurred forward by generosity around us, and uh, let's overspend on breakfast here in just a few minutes, okay? And uh, joyfully do that, knowing that all those dollars are going to go to uh, the very heart of God for children to be reached with the good news of the gospel and to be given the hope of the gospel into their lives. That's what we want. And that's what we're giving toward, and that's what those ministries, both in Rwanda, here, and in uh, our City Hope Center, that's what they're accomplishing. And uh, we're excited about it. I also wanted to make sure you didn't miss the update. If you missed that, Jeff sent a good little note to us. I did a little video for you. And uh, if you missed out on that update, it's a pretty incredible one, and it's about the uh, pursuit of permanence. So check that out on the dashboard. Or if you use the email that you never look at for church, then it's there. It's in your, wherever that email inbox is. Go there. You can find it. And uh, we need you to register. We've got some important things coming up uh, to do with our pursuit of permanence. Okay, we got Bibles. Let's get them out and let's get them going. John chapter 17. Everybody get to John 17 in your Bible or in your fake Bible on your device. <laughs> Whatever you need to do. If you didn't bring a Bible, I'm teasing. I'm only teasing. Kind of. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, uh, we have one for you to use. It's a hardback, real book. It's a paper copy of God's Word. And uh, page 849 will get you to John 17 with us. And if you borrow ours and don't have a Bible in your life, take it home. We would love to have it in your life beyond just today and into this week. So take advantage of that. Page 849 will get you right to John 17. And join us there. We're marching our way line by line, paragraph by paragraph through the Gospel of John, and every paragraph is written, it is an argument. It is compiled argument. It is trying to convince us. John tells us that at the end of this book, which we'll see soon, he says that he wrote all of this down, all of these signs, all of this teaching, all of these records are given so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Savior for our soul, and that he is the Son of God, the one and only uncreated, eternal Son of God, the second person of a triune God, God the Father, Son, and Spirit. The Son took human flesh, dwelt among us, was tempted just like us, but did not sin as we have always sinned, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, rose victorious over sin and death, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And everything we're studying is intended to convince us that's who he is. And as his people, to be convinced freshly, again, more, more convinced because we were together today, okay? So as we engage again with John 17, have an expectant heart. And if you don't know Christ, we're praying today will be that day that you meet him personally as the Messiah, the Son of God that came for your salvation. Now, John 17 is what we call the high priestly prayer, what is commonly called the high priestly prayer. And this is not a moment for us to merely listen in to John's record and to be unaffected. There's a lot of things in your life that you hear that do not affect the way you live. This cannot be one of them. 
okay? This can't be. As disciples of Christ, if in fact you're a true disciple, you're a follower of Jesus through faith, you've turned from any other way to get right with God and place your confidence in the work of the Son of God for you, it is not merely recorded for us to listen to it and think that's nice that Jesus prayed that way. No, it's more than that. The Spirit of God intends for us to listen with the 11 who are right there with him. They've left the upper room. They're on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus will be betrayed and crucified within hours. It's not enough to listen and go, well, that's good. We are to listen and join into the very heart of our Christ. To be a part of what he's praying, to be moved by what we're hearing through the spirit-inspired record of the Apostle John. So last week, we saw the priority prayer. At the very beginning of this prayer, he lays out what is most important to him. Fundamentally, his glory. Today, as we take our next step into this, we find not the priority prayer, but the identity prayer. If you're taking down notes, and I hope you will, or put them in your note app, whatever you do to record things, it'll help us to study now and review later. This now is the identity aspect of the prayer. Not everyone under the sound of my voice is a disciple of Christ. I get that. I understand that. But for those who are through faith in Christ, we are the people marked by our belief in what he says. Amen? Amen. Hey, we believe what he says. We believe what he says about us. We believe what he says about us more than what we feel about us. We believe what he says about us more than what we might have been told about us. You've got people who have told you things about you. Some of them have tried to tear you down about who you are. Some of them have been delusional in telling you how great you are. Either way, let's submit those things to the words of Christ as he prays on behalf of the 11 and indirectly then as we join in on our behalf as well. All right? We sing a song here called Christ Be Magnified. We love that song. And in the bridge it says, I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. These are the words of Christ, prayed for the disciples, in front of the disciples, to the Father, so that our identity would be secured by Christ. Let's read it. You ready? Get your eyes on it. Verse 6 of chapter 17 in John, Jesus says to the Father, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Verse 9, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world but for those whom you you have given me, for they are yours. Check this out, verse 10. All yours, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Let's stop right there. We'll pick back up next week in the prayer. These are God's words for us. May the spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Jot this idea down. Very simple. I hope you can memorize this one, at least the concept. True disciples live in Christ-clarified identity. What's happening in the prayer is that Jesus is speaking in front of the disciples about the disciples to the Father. It's a sweet gift from Jesus to pray out loud in front of his true disciples. There's only 11 left, right? The false disciple, the one who claimed to be with him but was not of him, has already been dismissed to go and do his betraying work, and he's doing it. But the 11 get to hear Jesus pray about them. Fundamentally, he is placing identity on them. He moves from all of the statements about glorify me and glorify me into they and those. These are big declarations that are made here. And the true disciples today and every day live in the Christ-clarified, Christ-communicated, Christ-declared identity that is revealed to us, at least in part here, in the high priestly prayer. 
Now, there are all kinds of identity markers in your life and in my life, and they're legitimate. They're identity markers that ought to be a part of who we are. We understand ourselves. We have gender identity markers given to us by the creator, two of them, male and female, two of them. We have age identifiers. Some of you feel yours more significantly than others. We have ethnicity, racial identifiers. It is a part of the beautiful mosaic of the Imagio Dei, of being created in the image of God, that humanity is marked by diverse ethnicities, nationalities, status, that is socioeconomic groupings. All of these are identifiers. Think about all the things that they ask you to check a box on whenever someone is trying to get who you are. You go to the dentist office. I don't know why they need to know all this stuff, but they ask you all these questions. Are you married, unmarried? Are you male, female? What ethnicity are you? See, I'm not, I'm not diminishing any of those. I'm saying that what Christ says about his people, his true disciples, is the umbrella over all of those and informs all of those. So within the identity markers, we submit our identity markers in this human experience. We submit those under what Jesus says about us in front of us recorded by the Apostle John to give us that identity. Understand that? You understand what I'm saying? So here's the question then. What is the identity that Jesus gives us? And there are two identifying markers that he gives. There are two statements that I'm gonna frame. I'm gonna show them to you in the text. And I'm praying that this will not just be a sermon you hear, but it'll be a sermon you preach to your own heart and your own mind in the week to come about your identity. So much of how you're living has to do with who you think you are and why you think you're here. So let's listen to Jesus. Here's what he says. Christ clarified, number one, then. Here's the first marker. I am a blessed believer. I am a blessed believer. And I want to unpack those two words. If, in fact, you are a true disciple, you are and I am a blessed believer. Now, blessed has been hijacked into meaning monetary blessing, meaning possession blessing, social media hashtag blessed, right? The blessing is always somehow in the West connected to wealth. But that is not the message of what it means to be a follower of Christ. In fact, the far and vast majority of our brothers and sisters in Christ will never hashtag anything as blessed based on monetary or possession level. There's something far more significant that sits over top of all of us who are true disciples of Christ. Something far more significant in the category of blessing that Jesus is drawing out for us as he says what he says. Notice what is given to us in verse six. I've manifested your name. We are blessed by Jesus making known the character, that's the name, the character of the Father to us. Directly to the 11 in their presence and indirectly to us through the revelation of the word of God. Jesus has made known to us the character of God. We would not know God, but we have been blessed because the son of God has made him known. Chapter one and verse 18 says that no one has seen God, but the only one who's at the father's right hand has made him known, has manifested him to us. We are blessed. We are a blessed people because Jesus has revealed to us the character, the name of God. In fact, so boldly was he attaching himself to the name of God that he used the name of God. You remember that in chapter eight? If you were around in chapter eight, that's been a, that's been a bit, that's been a few minutes. You should have already gone to consider if you were here in chapter eight. <laughs> you remember they were gonna stone him. They tried to kill him. Why did they try to kill him? Because he said before Abraham was, what did he say? I am, and they knew what that was. That was the name of God given in the burning bush to Moses in the Old Testament. And they tried to kill him because he was blaspheming. He was not blaspheming. He is the revelation. He is the manifestation of the character of God. We are blessed. Our eyes have been opened. Spiritually blind eyes have been opened to see the glory of God in the face of Christ as revealed here in the word of God. Secondly, we are blessed By this statement, look back at verse six. I manifested your name to people whom you gave me out of the world. We are blessed 
by the sovereign purposes of God in salvation, him giving to the Son a people from the world. Now, when, whenever you see the word world in your Bible, you're gonna have to have a, an understanding that what's around it will help you know what's meant by it. It could be the planet. It could be all the humans. It could be a segment of the humans. It could be a statement about every tribe, tongue, and nation. We'll see that in just a moment. But for now, in this moment, what is given out of the world is people from the world. In other words, from the lostness of the world, from the spiritual deadness of the world, from the sin nature of the world in which we were born, we have been given by the Father to the Son, and the Son has made known the name of the Father to us in his revelation. So we are a blessed people before the foundation of the world. God gave people to the Son. The Son secured them and will deliver them back to the Father. We found out all about this in chapter 10. You still should have gone to consider if you were in chapter 10. No one can pluck them out of his hand because the Father has given them to the Son. We are blessed, blessed by the sovereign work of grace toward us in God giving us to the Son. And then he goes further in chapter 17 and verse six. He says, yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. There is a blessing of the entrusting work of the Father who has us since eternity past. You say, how did I get to be the Father's in eternity past? Was he impressed? No. He was not impressed. You say, a little bit? Not even a little bit. Did he see my moral character and think, man, what an impressive human being that's going to be? I think we'll pick that one. No. All of his grace. All of his grace. In our Sin, we've been given to the Son who has blessed us with the manifestation of the name of the Father. And then he says in verse eight, I've given the words that you gave me. We are blessed by the revelation relay of truth through the Son, directly to the 11 who are standing before him, who would then be the relay to all of us who indirectly have received the truth of the gospel of the kingdom through the Son of God in human flesh from the Father blessed. So when we say we are blessed believers, listen, this is identifying us. This is in fact informing our lives. For, for some, you do not feel blessed right now. And your categories for that have been relegated to what is earthly. It doesn't feel good right now to be you. It doesn't feel like things are going your way. The blessings are not there. I was watching sports yesterday and there was a story on an athlete who had all of the potential to be a professional athlete at the highest level. And he had injury after injury after injury, so much so that in his senior year yesterday, he scored the first touchdown of his career and he wept. And my little boy was watching that. And he said, what is going on here? And I said, his life has been hard, bud. His expectations have not been met. But let me tell you something. If in fact, that young man is a part of the family of God. He is a blessed human being because the manifestation of the name of God has been delivered through Christ to him. He has been given by the father to the son and the son has rescued him and the relay of the truth of the gospel has come to him through the son along with all others who are true disciples. I am blessed. Now, pick apart with me the believer. Look at how Jesus describes us. He says now, they, look back at verse six, the very end, they have kept your word. We are believers through the keeping of the gospel word delivered through Christ. We are believers, not just in that way, but in verse seven, now they know that everything you have given me is from you. And in verse eight, for I've given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and they have come to know in the truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. Now that's a big statement. We know, we received, and we believe that the son was sent by the father. Listen to me. We would not be believers apart from the blessing of the grace of God. We did not arrive at this on our own doing. We didn't just wake up one morning and be like, you know what? I'm gonna figure this whole universe thing out. And we believed. Oh no, no, the blessing of the work of God toward us renders us under the identity banner of a blessed believer from every background, every story, every status, every other identifying marker comes underneath of this reality. We are a blessed people. 
And that should affect and inform everything about us. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Amen, church? We believe that. You say, I don't know that I believe it enough. You believe that. And we say, Lord, help my unbelief. We believe because of the work of the Spirit in us as his people. I think it was in eighth grade when I first encountered what happens when someone is concussed. It is not a funny thing to interact with somebody who is in a concussion, but there are some funny things that happen during the concussion. How many of you have been in a concussion situation in your life? You've had a concussion. You don't remember, do you? It's okay. <laughs> See, can be funny. I think I was in eighth grade. The goalie on our soccer team, he took a shoulder to the head in the middle of the game, and then he got kicked in the head near the end of the game, and the kick just finished it. He was in the locker room when we all got there. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know why we were there. He asked us probably 55 times what the score of the game was when we would tell him we were playing a game. What was the score? We told him that score over and over again. We all showered at that point. I don't know what they do now, but we all went to the showers. In the shower, the dude washed his hair like eight times. He couldn't remember that he'd already done it. Finally, somebody's just like, okay, we got to get him out of here. The reality was the blunt force trauma had scrambled his ability to decipher and discern the things that were most simple to him. The memory of what's been done to you and the memory of what you've done, the culture around you, the communication that's coming in, the people have spoken over you and to you, I believe at points our blunt force trauma to the believers and scramble our memory of who we are. So listen to our Lord Jesus pray and be reminded, though you may not feel it, that you are a blessed believer and preach that all week in the face of temptation and trial and struggle. We are blessed believers. In the face of despair and doubts, blessed believer. In the face of pain and pressure, Blessed believer. The face of loss and loneliness. Blessed believer. I'm talking blessing on the highest level. In the face of mockery and all the other markers that are being pinned to us. Blessed believer. And you know what that will produce? If you're jotting down, how does this affect my life? Gratitude. Gratitude comes from this and an ongoing walk with Christ. There is a gratitude that informs not just circumstantial issues, but there is something bigger than the circumstances in which I live. I am a grateful person, which is the heart condition that comes out in Thanksgiving, right? Gratitude is inside. Thanksgiving is on the outside. And as we head toward the night of thanks, do you know what informs our gratitude? We are a blessed people. God has worked toward us as sinners, rebels against him, hostile in mind, against him in every way. He's moved toward us. And through Christ, we have come to be the recipients of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are believers. We have believed in him and he is changing our lives gratitude and therefore an ongoing relationship with christ we walk with him because we are believers we are not in a religion we're in a relationship with the lord jesus because we are blessed believers do you get it understand that's the first one there's only two if you're thinking man we better get on to the next one no there's two i got all the time in the world here there's only two just want you to get them. I want you to feel them. If the Spirit of God will connect your heart and mind to what you can sense today. Here's the second one. Christ clarifies that number two, I am an adopted ambassador. I am an adopted ambassador. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my identity? True disciples live in the Christ clarified identity and all other identity markers Come underneath of it and submit to it. And here we find that no matter our circumstance in life, in the second part of what he prays now, in verses 9 through the first part of verse 11, he is clearly identifying us as adopted ambassadors along with the 11 who are directly receiving the benefit of him praying in front of them. We indirectly now, we're going to get our own direct aspect. He's going to pray specifically for you and for me in just a moment. But for now... 
pick up the benefit by listening in and being affected by what he says. I am praying for them, verse nine. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. There we go. That being the world as distinguished as those who are not yet his people, those who are outside of his kingdom. I'm not praying for those who are outside of the kingdom. I'm praying for those who are within the kingdom. I'm praying for the true, the disciples. And what does he say? For they are yours. I'm praying for those whom you give me, for they are yours. And the your, the pronoun your, you ready, grammar? Grammar, on Sunday morning, here we go. If you have a pronoun, you have to have an antecedent. You haven't thought about that since whatever grade that was. The antecedent is the father. He has called him the father multiple times in the prayer already. He's about to call him father again. He calls him holy father in the second part of verse 11. They are yours, Father. We belong to the Father. We're in the family. We are adopted fully and freely. We are eternally and forever adopted as sons and daughters. Loved ones, listen to me. In all of the melee of the culture in which we live, with our flesh screaming and our memories chattering at us about who we really are, be reminded by Christ you've been adopted. You are no longer an orphan enslaved to sin. You are an adopted son or daughter of the king. Yours they are. And he goes on to verse 10. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Absolute immovable claim on the disciples. It will not be reversed. It will not be revoked. You and I, through faith in Christ, are adopted into the family of the Father, co-heirs with Christ to the inheritance of heaven. Amen? You say, it doesn't feel like much is happening. You are blessed beyond comparison as a believer. And you have been adopted into the family of God. Jot down some passages. We'll have to go to battle on this this week. So let me give you some verses that you can go to. Perhaps you can put a little fighter packet together and memorize these. John chapter one and verse 12 says that for all those who believed, he gave the right to become sons and daughters of God. That's John one and verse 12. How about Galatians chapter four, verses four and five? Galatians four, four and five, where Paul says that just the right time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman under the law. Remember this? so that we might be adopted for the adoption, for the inclusion of sons and daughters, so that we sinners might be brought into the family, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, maybe the pinnacle of the declarations about the eternal sovereign purposes of God and salvation, he says we were predestined, we were predestined to adoption as sons. What he determined was for us to be family. That's what he determined. That's what he set his heart and mind to accomplish. And then Hebrews chapter two and verse 10 says that it is fitting that the high priest who made the sacrifice brings many sons to glory. The author and perfecter of our faith makes us sons and he brings us to glory. We are adopted, get it? Yours are mine, mine are yours. They are yours, Father. And we are ambassadors. Look at the end of verse nine. He says at the end of verse nine, or in the end of verse 10 rather, and I am glorified in them. There's the purpose, and I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. So Jesus says at the end of this, like, I'm leaving, I'm out, it's gonna happen, he's gonna die on the cross, he's gonna be resurrected three days later, he will be 40 days on the earth, seen by up to 500 disciples, and he will ascend to the right hand of the Father, and he has not yet returned, not because he forgot, but because he's patient, and he's saving people from every generation, every tribe, tongue, and nation. But we're here, we're here, and he says that they will glorify him. That's who we will glorify. We will be here. Now remember from last week, if you were with us, glorified, I am glorified in them, means that the awesomeness, the splendor, the majesty of Jesus is recognizable. People will see it and savor it. They will celebrate it because we're here. We are ambassadors for the king. We've been adopted by the king as sons and daughters of the king. And we're left here while the king is at the right hand of the father so that many would come to glorify the son through our lives. 
Listen to me. The East Valley of Phoenix is to be a place where ambassadors are invading homes and workplaces and recreation and friendships and neighborhoods, schools and universities. We are ambassadors. We are here on the mission of the king. Why am I here to be an ambassador? What about this trial, ambassador? What about this success, ambassador? What about this favor, ambassador? What about the great things, ambassador? What about the hard things, ambassador? What about the tragedies and the struggles that are going on in the culture around us, ambassadors? Ambassadors for the glory of Christ. So thankful for the clarity of Jesus' words for us. I am a blessed believer. I am an adopted ambassador. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, you know this as we call it the Great Commission. Jesus, post-resurrection, says that his disciples are intended to make new disciples from every tribe, tongue, and nation of all people. We are disciple makers as ambassadors. Acts chapter one and verse eight, he tells the same disciples who are listening to him pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon them in the full culmination of the new covenant reality. At the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit will come upon them and then they will go everywhere to be the ambassadors of Christ to the world. In fact, I don't think that's allegory. To Jerusalem first, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, I'm talking about all the way to Phoenix, Arizona the disciples will go. 2 Corinthians chapter five, verses 16 through 21. I want you to hear this one. I'm gonna read it over you. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. Listen to these words from the apostle Paul. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. That is just on a human level the way we used to. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we thought about him the same way, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world, that is, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are being saved, the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Amen? We are ambassadors. We are not ambassadors of our own ability to save. We are not those testifying to our own perfections. We are those with the message of the perfections and the glorious grace of the Son of God who entered our humanity, lived perfect obedience, died substitution death, rose victorious resurrection so that all who place their faith in him might receive salvation through him, period. We're here for him. We're suffering for him. We're succeeding for him. The whole story is for us to be ambassadors. Everything in our church family is about our ambassadorial life. Our small groups are so that our identity as ambassadors is secured. Our studies are to equip us as ambassadors to live on the mission of Christ. All of our next gen ministries are informing identity in Christ, placing before students and kids and young adults, all of our teams, placing before those teams the realities of what it means for us to be blessed believers and adopted ambassadors for our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you seem to have the most mundane life. It's not enough for you to think, well, I'm probably not gonna be in the history book. You're just wondering if anybody will even remember that you existed. Hear me now, friend, true disciple of Christ. You are an ambassador of the King. And he intends to use your life for his glory as you shine light in the darkness wherever you are, as you bring life and the message of life in the presence of death wherever you are, as you bring hope in the reality of hopelessness all around you. It is not for the history books. It is for the glory of the king who adopted us into his family and who made us ambassadors for him in this mundane, in this routine, in this life. Parents, Grandparents, ambassadors for those little children. 
ambassadors so that their identity as human beings is established through the worldview of the Bible sitting in your lap. Imagio Dei is being presented to them, but far more than that, parenting is an, uh, is an opportunity to be an ambassador for identity as disciples for those little children. So for many, there's a struggle for security. You are adopted. Come back and preach it this week. And for many, there's a struggle for purpose. Listen to me. Your job will tell you what you're here for. It'll tell you what your goals are. It'll set the agenda for you. The family you come from set agendas for you, told you what life was all about, told you what to live for. All of that has happened. Influences, coaches and teachers and different people have all influenced. Here's what you're here for. Here's how you can make an, uh, an impact. Here's what your purpose is in life. Come back, disciple of Christ, and listen in John 17 to the Savior pray in front of the disciples, about the disciples, to the Father, and remember you are a blessed believer and you are an adopted ambassador for the mission of Jesus Christ. You are secure and you have purpose in everything in which we live. Amen? We get it? All right, true disciples live in Christ-clarified identity. All right, let me give you some learning to live stuff. We always learn here in order to live, not just to learn. Take these home, don't pack up. Stay with me now, a couple more minutes. Number one, receive this identity for your soul. Friend, this is for you if you don't have Christ as your savior through faith. The opposite of these two identifying markers that Jesus prays about his disciples could be placed over your life. Not a blessed believer, but a condemned unbeliever. You'll face the full wrath, the justice of God against your sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of his glory. We've all gone our own way, born with a sin nature, chosen sin at every opportunity. But apart from Christ, who is the sinless one who can stand in as your substitute, pay your penalty, and grant you victory over sin and death through his resurrection life, and give you eternal life so that you can live life in his name. Apart from Christ, there is no hope for you. There's no other Messiah coming. There's no other Savior for your soul. You must receive this. You must place your faith in Christ. Turn away from any other agenda. It's not a partnership thing. It's not like I'll do my part. God will pick up the rest. It's not that at all. It's all Christ, or it's nothing. But in Christ, all of this identity is affected, and all the blessings are ours, and all of the purpose and hope are ours. So come with us. You've not found all the good people who got together to celebrate their goodness. You found the wicked, sinful people who have got together to celebrate the one who saved us. Come with us. Number two, church family, preach this identity to yourself. Preach. I mean literally preach. Come on, this is two points. I'm a blessed believer. I'm an adopted ambassador. You preach that to your heart and mind. You come back to John 17 and you let the words of Christ refresh you and renew you and revive you. Let the spirit of God use it. Let him speak about you. Who are you and why are you here? And what's going on with you still being here and he's not here? What's happening here? And, and why are you here? What is your reality? Preach this to yourself in every scenario this week. And when we're tempted to take pride in ourselves, we'll be humbled for the glory of Christ. And when we are tempted to think we've been forgotten, we will rest in the glory of Christ. Number three, live this identity with your neighbor. Now, wherever neighbors meet blessed believers and adopted ambassadors, they meet people who love them. We love our neighbors if, in fact, we're living in our identity as Christ followers. You say, what about all my other identity markers? What if those are different? Yep, they come up underneath of this big one. I'm a blessed believer, and I'm an adopted ambassador. Therefore, I love my neighbors. You don't know my neighbors. You don't know my neighbors. I turned them into the HOA many times. Well, that's on you. You say, I think my neighbors could be classified as enemies. Okay, good. There's a verse about that too. Love your enemies. <laughs> Live this out and be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. You've been transformed. You aren't who you used to be. You aren't who you will be, but you aren't who you used to be because your identity has been affected by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? My little dude, he's been getting into hip hop. I don't have a lot of hip hop experience in my life, but I got some. I got some. So he said to me in the car the other day, Dad, what's your favorite Christian hip-hop? So I, 
I was pulling, I mean, I was pulling from way back. But we found it, because Spotify is amazing. We found it. And I rejoiced at my son listening to this song in my car. Now, in our car, I don't know what your dial is, but we go from 10 to 14 in volume. 14 is kind of loud. We put it to 24, <laughs> put the windows down, and that car was thumping. <laughs> it was awesome. Here's the song. I'm not the shoes I wear. I'm not the clothes I buy. I'm not the house I live in. I'm not the car I drive, no. I'm not the job I work. You can't define my worth by nothing on God's green earth. My identity is found in Christ. It's found in Christ, end quote. Amen? Amen. True disciples live in the Christ clarified, Christ prayed, Christ declared identity that we have in him. God, thank you for your book. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for speaking it to us through John's record by the Spirit's superintending work. Now use it, God. I pray for your people who desperately need clarity and identity, who are battling for truth about themselves. Would you use it? And we pray for our friends that don't know you that you would use that blessing, that adoption that you work out only through faith in your son to draw them to faith in your son. Affect us as your people. Bring many more to be your people as we live as ambassadors on this earth. We believe what you say about us is true. Lord, help our unbelief. We pray this in your name. Amen.